the qualm. I thought everybody had a qualm. It wasn't until I was in my teens I realized our town was quite unique. Growing up where I did, it was just normal. It was just there. When I was about five my father took me there. It was a long walk, at least to my little legs. He held my hand. I remember my palm on his, how tiny I was. How safe his big broad shoulders and double bass voice made me feel. There was a strange mood that day, in the same way a mouse can smell the rain, I could tell something different was about to happen. And I remember I was nervous, just a little. But my father's presence grounded me. He led me out of our suburb and into the next, to the parts unmaintained by the local council. I followed in silence. We stopped a few feet from a ditch, and were still for a few moments. Do you know what this is, Stuart? My father asked, turning to look at me. I guessed. A ditch. No he shook his head. It looks like a ditch. But not quite. He held my hand, still, and we stood together, lightly buffeted by a cool wind. It picked up leaves and spun them in pinwheels, and lay them back to earth. I peered in. The ditch ran about 20 meters, which seemed huge then, and about two across. It was deep enough I couldn't have gotten out without climbing. On the sides were roots and rocks, and dirt the color of coffee grounds. Scruffy grass lined the top. I was confused. Look at the bottom, my father said. I did. The bottom was much the same as the sides, just dirt. I can't see anything, I protested, and my father kept his eyes on the ditch and said, look closer. I looked. I imagined myself the civet cat, a prick-eared hunter, searching for prey, then the deer, hidden, still as a statue in the trees, eyes wide, alert for danger. The shadows of the dirt clods caught my eye and I imagined drawing them, the texture, the depth, a thought far more complex in concept than I had the words for then, interesting, yes, but it was still a ditch, and then something moved in my perception and I froze, as I saw. Something shifted. On a surface level it looked like nothing was different, but looking closely there was a layer there, something moving, not quite aligned, superimposed, like a photograph taken on pre-used film. It made me feel strange. If I was older I might have run screaming, but I was five, and malleable, and my father was security itself. Is it a river? Underneath. Not any river you know. Do you see it? It's moving. Yes. I watched it in awe, quantum ripples curling through, layers deep. Like the fractal film of oil on water, fascinating, but almost like an optical illusion, hard to wrap your head around. But my father brought me here, it must be real. So I took it at face value. And then it was dirt again, just dirt, in two dimensions. What is it? I asked. It's called the qualm. I'd heard the word before, but never knew what it meant. This definition seemed as good as any. And as most five-year-olds from loving families do, I trusted my parents implicitly. So you understand why I stood at the edge of a ditch and listened to my father. Why I accepted it without question. The qualm is a vessel, he told me, even and calm, of sorts. Nobody knows where it came from. Nobody knows how it works, or how it exists. I think it's always been here, in some way or another. The qualm is here to help you. When you feel sad or angry and you can't hold it in any longer, you have qualms about something, or you're worried about something and just want to feel better. You can come down here and tell it to the qualm, and it will take the bad feelings from you. How? I asked, amazed. Nobody knows. He looked up and down it, still holding my hand. It just does, somehow. But there are rules. Just two. I need you to listen, and make sure you understand. Stuart. I nodded. I could hear how serious he was. Okay. Number one. He held up one finger. 
After you have used the Quam for the first time, you do not climb inside. No crossing it by walking through, no fetching something that falls inside. If that happens you use a stick to get it out or you call for help. If you want to get across it you walk around. You can jump across if it's an emergency, but you might fall in, so. You walk around. He gave me a look to make sure I understood, and I nodded solemnly. He nodded back, seeming satisfied. Good. Number 2. He held up two fingers. You don't take the mic with the qualm. Don't overuse it. You cannot come and talk to it every day. You get one turn a month. 1. You must never, ever do more than once a month. Why? I asked. It's too much, he told me. It'll overfill it. Do you understand? I nodded. I understood. My father asked if I wanted to have a turn now, but I shook my head. I had no pressing worries. So we left, waving bye to the qualm. On our way home he told me two more things about the qualm. He told me I could go any time I wanted as long as it was within the once a month rule, and I didn't have to tell him why. Then he told me I was not to go alone. He or my mother would take me. When can I go by myself? I asked. When you're 12, he said. My first catharsis, that was what they called talking to the qualm, was a few weeks later. I was upset about something at school, something minor for an adult but big for a child. I can't remember what now. I asked my father to take me. We walked together like the first time, into the unknown. We were quiet. I felt a little nervous, but his presence reassured me. We arrived at the qualm to find it quiet. It looked just as innocuous as it had the first time. I shuffled to the edge and looked in. Dirt and foliage. Same as before. I remember asking how you did it. My father said I could do it however I wanted. You can say it, or you can just shout, some people do that. Try and feel it, really feel it, in here, he touched his chest, and then do it. He pointed toward the ground. Stand by the edge, not too close, that's it, and look in. I'll stand over there. Privacy was important at the qualm. My father waited by a tree a few meters away. I looked at him. He gave me a thumbs up. I turned back to the ditch and tried to feel the injustice. It rankled. I tried to see what I'd seen before, the phantom shift, the holographic layers, I almost caught it, and I remember the exact words, I said, I don't like this feeling. There was a momentary pause, then the film shifted. A little flutter of nerves caught me. I shut my eyes. I felt a tugging in my chest, which alarmed me, but it was over quickly, a brief pull like stretching gluten, then it was gone. I opened my eyes to see what looked like the underlayer pulling back, at almost an atomic level I was aware of it, little fibers of matter receding film like into the dirt. There was something else too, an awareness, what a cliché, staring into the abyss and having it stare back, yet it was true, just for that moment, we saw each other. And it was done. The dirt was just dirt, the qualm empty. I felt lighter. Good. I think I laughed. My father came to get me and asked how I felt. I told him it was gone. He nodded, smiled, said, remember, once a month, and I nodded, and we went home. The thing about the qualm, and, I suspect, another reason we weren't allowed to use it more frequently, was how easy it could be to become reliant on it. It was why I always tried to process things myself before I did a catharsis. Going to the qualm did not make you happy. It didn't stop you feeling bad. It made you feel normal. And even in my childhood mind, again without the vocabulary to express it, I saw the danger of the qualm. I began to understand how it could become addictive. Now, the qualm wasn't a secret. Everyone around me knew about it, so I thought it was normal to have one. 
My mother and father went to the Quam to purge themselves of any bad feelings, my siblings too. I was the third of four, and my sisters already knew. In our family we learned when we were five. When my little brother first visited two years later he crept into my room and told me all about it. The Quam was a useful thing for us over the years. When I was ten and my grandfather died I sat with my grief for two weeks until I had time to go again, and screamed into the abyss until it dragged my pain away. My eldest sister had turned twelve the year before so she took me, and looked away and covered her ears. When I was thirteen and the girl I liked didn't like me back, I was thirteen and this was serious, I gave myself a few days and cried into the qualm. It soothed me. When I got in trouble at school for something that wasn't my fault, I came down to the qualm. When I argued with my friends, I grumbled into the qualm. It was like free supernatural therapy. Of course, we were encouraged to process our feelings as best we could. And privacy was a big thing too. If somebody else was doing catharsis you had to stand far back enough that you couldn't hear them and wait for them to finish. That was manners. As for never walking inside it after your first catharsis, it was easy not to do, but I wondered if it did not extend to other animals besides humans. In all my visits I had never seen an animal inside, but occasionally they would be at the edge, and skitter away when they saw me. Either it was a coincidence or the qualm held sway over them too, though I did not know if they avoided it or utilized it. One day when I was 14 I was playing with my brother in the backyard. Our sisters, Elsie and Melissa, were out the front, we were thwacking a ball back and forth. My brother was in a testy mood, and eventually suggested a walk to the qualm. I accepted. I had no catharsis to make, but went anyway, figuring why not. So Caleb and I went to the qualm, past our sisters, picking our way through foliage and talking about nothing in particular. When we got there it was already occupied, so we hung back and waited for the man to finish. On his way out he nodded to us and averted his eyes. I think that guy was here last week, Caleb said. I frowned. Couldn't have, I said. Nobody's that barefaced. I stood back and covered my ears while Caleb shouted his catharsis. When it was done he tapped me on the shoulder. He looked looser, lighter. You want a turn, he asked, but I shook my head. No, another day. We went home. Two weeks later I went by myself. I went at night, as is my preference, picked through the foliage as usual. It was eerie in the dark, but I liked it. The world gleamed silver in a pleasing way. And it was quiet at night, there was less chance of having to wait your turn. But not that night. When I arrived, someone was kneeling by the qualm. He turned his head as I approached. It was the man from the other day, when I visited with Caleb. But that was impossible. It had only been two weeks. We were supposed to wait a month. And Caleb had seen him there only a few days before. And that meant. A horrible feeling formed in my stomach. He hadn't just broken the rule. He'd broken the rule twice. Or, he was a twin, I thought hopefully, wrestling with my conscience. Perhaps he was an identical twin, that was all, and it was all just a big misunderstanding. Before I got halfway to him, he screamed into the abyss. And the abyss did not just look back. It rose. I shrank back in horror as the heart of the qualm split open and thrust itself out of the ditch. A black mass emerged, sticky and wet. It broiled over with peak and venom, like tar, thick, dark as night on the North Sea, glistening, listening, angry. It writhed, it no longer only heard, but told. The void had stretched to convexity in its rage, and I felt its chilling radiance from where I stood frozen behind a tree. The man stumbled back but the qualm was quicker. A thing, like a tentacle of blackness, reached for him and seized his face. He buckled. It held him there for a moment, his screams untaken by the void, and returned him back to the ground on which he lay. Then, 
as though nothing had occurred at all, the tentacle shrank back into the ditch, and the qualm was still. I ran over. The man lay absolutely still in a crumpled heap. He looked, I leapt back, heart racing. His face. It was completely black, dark as the abyss, and his whole body radiated a very slight chill. I swore and grappled for my phone. I called an ambulance first, then my parents. The qualm did not move. The man stirred. The blackness drained from his face as he woke, mumbling incoherently. I tried to tell him where he was. But I didn't have time. As soon as consciousness had set in he began to scream. Screaming like he was being attacked, like he'd had the most horrible fright. I tried to stop him, I really did. But he was a grown man and too wound up. He ran, and by the time the ambulance and my parents arrived he was gone. They found him sprinting across the main bridge over the river. He was about to jump in. They managed to subdue him, which was a struggle. A passerby had to help. When they took him to hospital he kept trying to harm himself in the ambulance. When I went to bed that night my father tucked me in. He sat on the edge of the bed and asked if I wanted to talk about what happened. I didn't. He said that was fine. Then he asked me if I understood what had happened, and I said yes. I understood. This was what happened if you broke the rules. That man spent the next few years in and out of psychiatric hospitals. He had to undergo extensive therapy. All those catharses into the void. And if the qualm overflowed, if you used it too much. It took him years to recover. Now, I still go to the qualm. If I feel the need. And it sits, and it listens, and lightens. I never forget. I count the days between visits and treat it with care. Because I do not want the void to blacken and churn and throw a thousand qualms back out at me. I do not want the weight of that horror to touch my heart. My catharsis cleans me. That would destroy me. I go. I do. But I never break the rules.